imagination can exist where it feels like hope is completely lost and it might look different. It might not look like loads of workshops of post-its and dreams and 100 years from now, but it is a massive act and leap of imagination to believe in anything in this time, to have children in this time, to build community in this time, to keep trying in this time. The people are more powerful than those structures. And we're just at a particular moment right now where everything feels really, really difficult. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Imi Carr. Imi is the co-founder of the Impact Hub in Birmingham, which ran for five years up until 2019, and the co-creator, co-dreamer, co-imagineer of Civic Square in Birmingham, a project which is completely reimagining and recreating a public space where people can convene, where ideas can be shared, where mutual aid can be provided and where people can reclaim the act of community as a form of resistance. This is an extraordinary episode. Amy is so knowledgeable and her and her team have been doing such incredible work for the people of Birmingham for the past 13 years. She speaks eloquently and eruditely about the challenges that we face in our modern society and the importance of imagination when breaking out of the stories that we currently exist in to create a better world and a better us. That's the term that she uses in the episode. She talks about how you can't build the future on top of the past, explaining land contracts and economic systems, which often impede community projects from achieving their full potential. She uses this to open up a conversation about interdependent systemic links that render our global system frail and vulnerable, as we saw during the pandemic, and highlighting the importance of community spaces not just as acts of resistance, but as nodes of support and survival when the system begins to collapse, again, as we saw during COVID, certainly in the United Kingdom, when people were coming together to protect and help one another. She talks about the importance of building on a neighborhood scale and the kind of infrastructure that communities can put into place. She talks about the long history of the battle between the elite and the workers and how democratic access to knowledge is critical to building a better society, and yet how this moment in history is particularly bad because, as she explains, even the industrialists in the past were investing in upskilling their labourers to a degree. Whereas now, it seems, the people of nations around the world have been left to suckle at the teat of dystopia. Sorry for the drama, but that really is the situation at the present time. This doesn't stop her from being hopeful, and this is an incredibly imaginative and creative episode, one that will fill you with positivity, with action, with knowledge, and with the inspiration, I hope, to go out and do something for your own community. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Imi, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So what you've done in Birmingham has been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, can you walk us through your journey from even before Impact Hub and then Impact Hub and now leading on to Civic Square? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's definitely a work in progress and it, it builds on the work of so many people. So I think it's important to make sure that kind of we don't get too much into the kind of um, usual tropes of heroics. It really has been... Mm built on a city that is full of incredible energy that has, uh, you know, moments of really exceptional history and how it's organized. Um, and yeah, continues to have so many uh, amazing leaders and organizers doing so much here. 
And, and equally, it kind of really builds on the fact that we've been part of an ecosystem for for such a long time that of people that are doing just remarkable work, which I'll share a little bit as I take you back through the journey. But um, I guess it that there's you know let's not do one of those kind of it will start at five years old. I was sitting there like we'll, we'll cut straight to the um, to the moment because you know everything builds on everything. Um, but I'm sure people don't have an hour to have a therapy session with uh, Imi. Um, but like. If we start back at, at TEDx Brum, this was a, a group of people who came together as volunteers who were in other careers, um, uh, working in other things. I, at the time, was working in um, a housing association and uh, Annika Diva, an organiser in Birmingham, brought together some volunteers to say, let's put on the first TEDx in, in Brum. Uh, really inspired by the fact that the city's leadership didn't look like the young, super diverse demographic it talked about. Um, it was really celebrated that we were the youngest and most diverse city in Europe at the time. And, um, but, but our institutions didn't look like that. And Annika brought a group of people together, right? This is back in 2011. So almost with everything that's happened, a uh, like different era, what, what it feels like to me, mm-hmm. to me now. Um, and, um, and it was one of the first times, I guess, seeing what happens, I think this is well known now, but you know, where people were starting to break down their silos of how they organized, who they worked with. We were, um, moving away from, uh, kind of just this idea of, uh, the corporate sector and other spaces. There was uh, business people in it. There was people like me, there was an amazing librarian um, and we just came together as volunteers. We started with like um, 10 of us and 100 people at the first event and by 2017 there was 100 volunteers and 2,000 people at the event and it had one one key thing that I in retrospect can now really uh, understand to be critical in this work which is that it was a platform to convene uh, and it was a platform to put uh, to platform voices that and ideas that were on the edge of society, right? And for us, it was really critical that it was more non-Western, um, more uh, basically not the white men who ran the city with all due respect to to them because we had a whole incredible dividend of people that had so much to offer and so much energy and it was largely ig- ignored by this kind of um, really uh, uh, inspired by the industrial era, sort of corporate era, corporate sector and a public the sector that was, yeah, the establishment, a public sector that was large and going through some real challenges with its own decentralization and devolving its powers, right? And, um, and so that's where things started. And I, I guess I never really realized how powerful that would be um, and how important ha- having a platform to share ideas in this way would be. I don't think I'd estimated at all um, uh, th- what the palpable energy I would feel in those events and the next logical question um, for a lot of people um, became like, what's what's next, right? This energy wants a once a year in this amazing process that we go through working together, figuring out these challenges, working across our usual um, silos. Um, and so I wrote a blog in 2013, which just asked the question, what if TEDx Brum was every day? Um, and not obviously the event, because that would be ridiculous, but the spirit of collaboration and creativity and voices from all different walks of life and ideas with a real kind of vigorous and palpable vision and ambition for the future and a real honest look at where we are at and what's coming, right? What if that was every day? And I expected like a few people to maybe read it, um, but actually uh, it really became quite popular. And again, like very normal now uh, in an era of social media, but again, a massive moment for me when I, Realize like you just got to put out 
you just got to put out what you believe is possible and mm. share it as vulnerably and as openly as you can. And I mean, you've got to hope you've got good people around you because that vulnerability, especially in this now, you know, 10 years on from 2013, God, social media is a very different place. But loads of people responded and we just started having little coffee shop meetups. I just started to meet the people um, who who replied and we had little meetups and we got a tiny bit of funding from Unlimited. Um, as I really ambitiously gave up my job uh, and was like, I'm going to go build whatever this thing is years <laughs> and years too early, just to be really clear. Um <laughs> And we got we got a small grant from Unlimited, which we just used to pay for like coffees, little bits of room hire, and so on and so on. And um, and just started asking the question. I guess now we would frame it as what if what 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 are we all searching for? What is what is this next uh, leap? And I guess I could sum it up now because we were young and we were kids, and there were a lot of people saying, "Who on earth do these people think they are?" As well, um, but I guess it was a range of different ideas that were swirling around. There's something about the incredible civic capacity of the city, um, the energy there was for people from many different walks of life, uh, wanting to have an active role in the, in the challenges that we face and, uh, and to unleash that creativity and energy um, in, in towards, towards social issues. And then thirdly, was um, I bumped into a chap called Indy Johan who ran in something called um, Zero Zero, uh, which has all sorts of different things, such as WikiHow, Start Matter Labs, many other things now. And his work at the time was really talking about how we were organized uh, according to silos and how our, our challenges are systemic. And if, we, if we're going to tackle them, we have to start organizing our finance, our governance, our spaces, the way we work much more systemically, right? And he did a talk, I think, at TEDx Oxbridge back back then. And that really changed my entire outlook. And so what I learned quite quickly then is we do have to figure out how to harness this energy and take the next step. And so in some visits, we happened to meet people who ran the Impact Hub Network. and this was really, again, really interesting to me. Physical, tangible spaces where people were coming together to give this work form and space and convening and power. And we all know in the city how much space equals power as well, right? And I was just starting to think about how do we take this to the next level and cut through like a number of years there. We ended up deciding to do an impact hub. Um, basically very inspired by Oakland's Impact Hub, who were moving away from this idea of just lots of middle-class people in work co-working spaces to really these convivial, um, in Oakland it was a black-led civic town hall uh, for, for the resistance, uh, trying to find a way to also create a business model, right, to help sustain and keep it, keep itself away from uh, needing to be largely funded or um needing to to be really expensive for example and so we did that and we did a crowdfunder and um we co-built the space it was one of the biggest crowdfunders at the time crowdfunders hadn't really taken off in the way they had now we co-built the space um and we ran this um what i'd say incredible civic space for five years full of all sorts of life and energy and creativity and experimentation and keeping on moving and platforming this idea that there is systemic change that was required. So to not get it just lost in the allure of Silicon Valley tech innovation scale, scale to ship out as many social businesses that can scale. Like we just weren't interested in that. We used the physical space as a kind of Trojan horse to hire and to make, uh, to earn revenue, to keep it going. And then we were platforming ideas about the land economy and the land contract re being reimagined, the deep systemic roots of the housing crisis. We were trying to really bring out a very different conversation. And we did that with force and creativity and a diversity of people and ideas for many, many years. On the day that it opened, 
or I think the week before, Indy Johar, he said this to me. He said, you're opening a co-working space, but it's not a co-working space. And I was quite young and I was like, what the heck? He's like, you can't call it a co-working space. I was like, what the heck? What do you mean? What do you mean I can't call this co-working space that we need to sell some co-working and some event spaces? And he was like, it's because you've got to really use that as a, as just the way you convene and generate revenue, but you have got to really start to reform this idea of the civic spaces we need in the future. And then secondly, the other thing he said is the business model is going to fail, but we have to do it anyway. And can you imagine like I'm like 26, 25, 26 years old and I'm like literally giving up my job and been living at home. My parents are like, what the heck is going on here? And then this guy's like, the whole thing's going to fail, but we have to do it anyway. And as those five years went on, and this is the critical bit that sort of goes into, into Civic Square. As those years went on, I understood fundamentally though what he meant, much to my dismay. When he lis- if he listens back to this, he's going to be laughing his head off. Um, but like, you know, I really did understand that because actually, um, the mo- the 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 land contract and the ideas that we were building all of this more progressive work on, the ideas that underpinned that about our economy, about how the system of land works, how property uh, works was broken and it was not just broken it was stuck in a in another century in a different paradigm right so just as a really quick example in in the example of the hub the better you did the better we did and we did really well for a group of young people who did this with a crowdfunder we were at our peak trading revenue of about half a million pounds right as young kids we were doing good but the better we did and we invested that all back into the organization we took fairly well at that time fairly low salaries um which i don't recommend but we had to um the better we did the more the landlord would put up the rent the better we did the more the landlord would put up the rent Mm. the better we did yada yada the better that more that happened the more we had to charge the less inclusive we could become the more you go you just sleepwalk into a model of like elite middle class space for people who can afford it or companies who can afford it right and that was just a tiny snippet um in those years uh there was thousands and thousands and thousands of ideas that we were lucky to see have people come to visit us high street projects all sorts of visions and they're all stuck in the same problem right um and so this was an example of for me actually what Indy really meant about the dark matter like you can't just build the future on the top of mm. outdated uh, contracts ideas systems rules legislation the reinvention of those is going to be as critical as everything else um and the fact that people had to really be part of that story it's something that people have to really understand and that we can build this systemic awareness and knowledge. Um, and so that's what led to uh, Civic Square. This kind of learning of all of that, closing the hub at its peak, which, you know, I still miss it today. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like a footballer retiring at that right moment. We closed it at its peak rather than let it be just washed away by the same dynamic. Um, and then really focusing on what that, what we had learned and what the wider context was telling us, right? By now, scientists and the IPCC who've been telling us for decades are literally screaming, screaming at us, right? Like uh, about what's happening. Um, and you can start to hear and see some of the impacts more clearly. So in December 2019, we closed the hub, having done a, a year close down process like we did the year opening process. We've co-designed and co-dreamed and worked with partners, neighbours, the community on what it means to move into the neighbourhood scale, a scale both big enough and small enough um, that you can really see systemic and tangible impact uh, happening in tandem. And what it means to build the infrastructure for that. And I'll tell you a bit more about that later on because I think there's some 
historical things I want to go back to as to what inspires what we're doing. Um, but if I keep talking now, literally, I'll just wait be able to get another question in. Um, but the <laughs> the the piece that was really critical was then we move over there, and in March, the pandemic hits, and all our mm-hmm. plans slow down, and we have to pivot like everybody else in the world. But there was a there's a document, um, and I'll show you some links um, of the vision we'd put out there that you can maybe put alongside this um, alongside this podcast because we'd really written about the interdependent systemic risks that we were all facing, and what is now being talked about as perma crisis and poly crisis, um, and what it would mean to build infrastructure for that. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and then everybody mm-hmm. saw in practice the criticality of where we live the places that are close to us doesn't mean that we take a isolationist localism type approach you know a planetary interdependence we all know is absolutely critical and the only story we can pursue and that's different from globalism um but we had we had seen it and experienced it and we had understood what's what started to matter in crisis. And so if you listen to the, what the IPCC is saying, which is we have to do everything we can, but we have already breached and it is going to be about coming back from that, which you can easily extrapolate that a number of decades of crisis are ahead, at mm-hmm. which point things like COVID in the Western world can show us in the global north can show us a bit more of what that would look like right of course in the global south people have been experiencing the impacts of largely our behavior for a long time but for us we started to see how fragile our systems were and where resilience really does lie and what happens and what might happen as we and what might not happen as we start to heal or start to organize in in some of those spaces so if anything, that period really kind of highlighted more deeply to us about the criticality of this scale of organizing, not in um, isolation, like I said, and not instead of the city, the region, the nation state and so on, but why it was so important. And I can talk, I'm going to tell you a bit more about Civic Square and that in a second, but that's where we're at. We're really interested now in what it means to build the social and civic infrastructure for climate, ecological and social transition at the neighborhood scale um and that can be quite a broad definition but um yeah i'll I'll tell you more about civic square in a moment wow (laughs) that was lovely and you are lovely to listen to i always felt like i was in a trance you can you can just go (laughs) for the remaining you know 40 minutes please i know it's been it's been a busy 12 years you know i have no shortage of uh, things i could talk about and tell you about so i have to kind of like stop myself to be like hold on a second this is actually meant to be a conversation (laughs) no do you know there, there is so much to be learned from everything that you and your team have achieved in no way does this have to be a conversation. Please lay it on me, lay it on the listeners. <laughs> we, need to, we need to learn yeah. what you have done so that people can replicate it. Because as you're saying, this neighborhood infrastructure is exactly what we need, have needed for a long time, but especially going forward. So please launch into Tell me about Civic it. Square. Okay, so, so yeah, look, okay, right. I'm going to say this with a caveat because of course, the last 13 years, we, I've had a rude and sharp, political education and awakening Mm. that it is not true that every generation takes forward the things that we know to be true right like we know over the last 13 years and true to a thriving and healthy society we knew a lot of what social infrastructure clean air good quality housing uh you know uh, not a ravaging inequality across us all meant we knew this i live in birmingham and even the worst of the extractive industrialists started to understand a cracking society has an impact on their bottom line and the mm. best of them perhaps the quakers really understood what it meant to invest in public good uh, in order to keep the the uh conditions for a, a, for what they understood to be a thriving society at that time looked like albeit with lots of problems, right? Um, because a lot of the industrial 
times uh, relied on deep extraction from the global south and had a really um, difficult relationship with class and the pecking order. Right? But, but I thought naively, and this is why if you're listening and you've got children in political education when they're younger, uh, is really, really important. No shade to my parents, they were just trying to survive. Um, but we didn't, right, so we've, we've pulled away. We've undermined all that we learned about children's centres and youth clubs and local infrastructure and places for people to meet and the thriving high street and capital in the most extractive ways has started to rule everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to say this with a caveat. What I'm about to say, especially if there's some older, wiser people than me, start screaming whilst listening at this podcast yes we have always known um that there is a layer of infrastructure that is critical to thriving societies and yes in the last 12 to 13 years it's been completely undermined and stripped and pulled back um and it's really important that that we continue to fight for and be propositioned about what needs to happen next. So alongside the restoration of a basic um, safety net and infrastructure for society, I think it's time to really think about what, what we do need at a neighbourhood scale with some more granularity. Um, and so I'm going to tell a little story of neighbourhood transitions that I think might resonate with people particularly in this country and like i said the last couple of years that rude political awakening has made me think about what types of parallels we're trying to draw now i descend from Punjab. i have quite different views i'd say about the way we should live and work and have grown up in that um and draw from many sort of non-Western examples of change and transformation and stewardship. And so, but I've been trying to think like, I'm here now. I've watched all that's happened since 2011, since we started this work. What do we, how, how do we deal with that, right? I can sit in an alternate reality and tell a story of a different place and continue to watch Brexit and culture wars and everything happen. What? Where where are we? So I started to just think about historically, what, where are, where have we seen other times where we've made transitions, and so that's where I think we are now. We're in one of those inflection points where, in lots of different scholars talk about the old world and the systems that are breaking down, and at the end of the days, and the new world not arrived yet, and here we are, gloriously sat in the middle of it. Big up mm. the geriatric millennials who have just only ever seen one <laughs> financial crisis or something after another. <laughs> and lucky for us, here we are right in the middle of it. And let's be clear, in the global north, having created most of it. Um, and, and so we, we know that the way we live, work, play, exist is going to totally transform. And then you add on the layer that we know that the IPCC and many other scientists have been trying to tell us about breakdown of the fundamental systems that affirm life and keep us in being here. Um, and you know, Kate Rayworth says this quite clearly as well, that actually she doesn't believe that even the people who came up with some of the 20th century economic ideas and rules would say that they are mm -hmm. relevant now, right? Like yeah. they're, out of, they're out of date. No. So there's a moral story, but there's also just a, like a societal story of transformation required because the ideas that we are living by do not serve the reality we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. And we've known that for a long time, um, but now it's like screaming at our face. It's imperative of us. So we're in this place where we're going to be transitioning through a lot of this uh, and it's going to be bumpy and terrifying and could be full of imagination and proposition and hope as well. And in other times of society, we've, we've, in British society, we have had moments like this. Um, and Carlotta Perez, the economist, talks about um, the infrastructuring of transitions, um, how important the infrastructure that we build has been 
in the societal scale of transition. So we look at times like post-war Britain. Um, we were broke. We were unproductive, as the 20th century economic, economic ideas talk about. We needed to rebuild our country. And you couldn't just have like a prime minister stand up and say, can everybody just get healthy and well? Like, we need you to rebuild the country. And everybody sat in their, like, post-war slums. It's just like, yeah, I'll just get my trainers on, right? We'll go park run and we'll be ready to build this country back. Like, that's not how things work. Um, there was layers and layers and layers of issues and challenges. And one of those infrastructure investments that we understood was the NHS. When we mm. built the NHS, we built it as a national system. Massively radical idea, 40 or 30 years before the idea that health would be a point of need, not if you could pay, was a radical idea, right? Um, one that you could not imagine, that you couldn't imagine would happen in the way British society was structured. Um, and we built the national system, we built the regional systems, but then we built a critical last piece of that infrastructure, arguably for me, the most important one for societal wide transition. Um, and that was the neighborhood GPs, democratic access to the spaces, the expertise, the ideas, the things you needed to uplift your health. In that time, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't like it would have been now, but it understood very clearly that that neighborhood scale was critical and important. And 30 to 40 years before that, things like the medical aid societies, worker-owned cooperatives or worker-run cooperatives in particularly the mining towns of Wales were starting to organise around their own needs. And people will know Bevin talks about the Treadgar Medical Aid Society as the inspiration for the NHS um, some 40 years later, right? The Treadgar Medical Aid Society was a demonstrator in a micro way of people starting to organise around um, this radical idea, which later on became adopted as a societal scale um, intervention. And of course, it wasn't, the NHS was a process, and so was a social transformation. So was our understanding of health. And again, like I said at the beginning, a lot of that has been also really undermined and destroyed this last um, few decades. Um, or perhaps not updated with what we know we now need is incredible movement of medical professionals who are um, actively building the deep links between personal health and well-being and planetary health. There's a great planetary health movement going on now. So, you know, even, even the things that we know matter will need deep upgrading of their ideas and their, and their thinking. Um, and similarly was true of things like the community libraries um, at, at another time of moving from an industrial era of working to a more technical and technological era. No prime minister or no like factory boss could say, could everybody go and get smarter? Like, can you go get smarter? Like it's more complex cognitive work required now mm -hmm. and y'all just don't have the knowledge. Um, they understood, right? Yesterday I was at Faircroft College in Birmingham, which was an intervention by the Cadbury's. Um, it was very focused on working class people and the skills and learning that they required at the same time that Chamberlain was building Birmingham University that, of course, would have been for the elites of the time, right? And mm -hmm. Faircroft College to this day still works um, very particularly um, with people with special education needs, with people recovering from many different um, addictions or uh, uh who were previously incarcerated and, and so on, right? And so the principal there talked to me about how they really understood at the time that actually you have to invest in these layers. Um, Carnegie, for all the problems of all these industrialists, the Carnegie libraries were um, an investment they ended up making. Now, of course, this is a lot of guilt easing and many other extractive practices in the time. It's not to like romanticize that time, but even at that time, those who had most to lose from society collapsing on itself or not being adequately able to transition into what was required next understood the investments into the public good that they were required to make. And, it, you know, 
the Quaker end yeah. of that, the round trees and the Cadbury's perhaps understood that even more from a values led space. And then, so, you know, we go through his, the his, the hundred years that led to a number of different library legislations and, and you end up today with, again, it's being decimated, but we went through a period where we understood that democratic access to knowledge where you are is critical, free, yeah. um, local, and the ability for you as a society to have access to the things that you need to make that transition. And, and like the medical aid societies before, there would have been micro examples and organizing of this at all different scales. Um, and it wouldn't be absurd to think about tr pulling away the neighborhood GPs or the um, community libraries now. It'd be absurd if you said we're just ripping them all away. Somehow we managed to do that with the children's centers. Um, and we've put up with a lot from this government these last 12, 13 years. But, um, well, I'd, sorry, but just to interject, uh, news this morning, the six public libraries in Aberdeen are being shut down. Yeah, well, exactly right. So, yeah, that, well, there we go. And in Birmingham, a lot of the community libraries had been are being shut in Birmingham in place of the large large city centre one. And I, I absolutely agree with that. That's why I started with that caveat to say, look, mm. let, let's, let's be really clear. We are absolutely fundamentally destroying the fabric of what will create not even thriving neighborhoods at the moment because that infrastructure is only really to support humans at the moment we have to make the next leap um to a much more ecological and social uh, balance but let's be really clear yeah we're, we're ripping uh, uh, so much of this away but i still think somewhere at the heart of our society we understand that you know those things matter right um if there's one Can library I left in go on sorry but i just you, you brought to mind a conversation yeah. i had a few months ago uh with somebody who studies existential risks mm -hmm. and they were saying um that there's like this is a very deliberate undermining of the social fabric now yeah because you don't need to upskill your laborers anymore because yeah. of technology because yeah. of ai because of all of this and actually, if you deplete what they have access to in yeah. the material world and in the social world on a physical level, then you're forcing them to engage in industry, but this industry where they are the product, i.e. Netflix and the metaverse. You make the outside world so unbearable and boring, essentially, that they are forced to, uh, to buy access to pleasure because the social world has been completely destroyed. And he was saying that is sort of the strategy now that is happening at the yeah, top I, level. Yeah, I would, yeah, I'd, I'd uh, absolutely uh, collude with that uh, <laughs> idea. Uh, yeah, if Indy J was here, he'd be, he'd be talking about a lot of the deliberate strategies that are being deployed. Um, but these are very, uh, these are, these are in the image of Silicon Valley. They are very low level of understanding of what's coming. Um, and, and, you know, I can talk a little bit about the, that p piece around AI um, in a sec. Um, to speak to that because, yeah, I think these are very unsophisticated views. And like we said, they, it, it is what happens when capital, extractive capital basically runs everything. Um, and so Civic Square was really a kind of response to this. Um, it isn't to say that civic, I want thousands of civic squares everywhere around the world, not at all. I wanted to really demonstrate and build in an inner city neighborhood, much like the one I grew up in, a lot of our team grew up in Birmingham, what the equivalent access and democratic access to infrastructure, knowledge, spaces to convene um, would look like in response to the social, economic, um, ecological transition that we need to make, right? What is the typologies of what should our high streets look like? What should our school playgrounds and front lawns and empty shops? What sorts of modules of ideas and things will we need for this next layer? Now for us, we're building it in an old industrial estate um, that was due to be demolished for flats and 
we were able to really push for a different idea around what well, that could well be. Well done. Um, and yeah, and um, it's really focused around demonstrating what that looks like, and particularly what that looks like. Like I said, in in the city of Birmingham, there's incredible people doing amazing centre of alternative technology in McCunclough, Wales, and Schumacher College in Totnes, and loads of really brilliant rural ecological powerhouses in the UK. Um, the Eden Project uh, are demonstrating lots of what could be possible if we re- reimagine the way things work in terms of in relationship with the local ecology. But I was really interested in what that looked like in, in a city level with the access to the spaces, the tools, the micro factories, the community kitchens, convening spaces, the learning spaces, the intergenerational spaces. And yeah, we're trying to build this at quite a scale, not with the idea that everybody has to build massive multi-million capital projects all over the place, although there are a lot better ideas of what we could do um, with a lot of our large empty spaces. But it was also to be able to almost modulize it, make it a pattern library of things. Like we know that we the types of things that we need on our high streets. We know the libraries of things, the men shed, the, the intergenerational spaces, what we need to do with childcare, the, the, how people need to work closer to home. Um, how, Sorry, I mean, could yeah, you explain gosh. some of these concepts for somebody that, like the library of things? Some listeners yeah, might not yeah, that. absolutely. So the library of things, there's this idea, uh, the actual organization library of things was set up by um, Rebecca Trevelin and co-founders. Um, but there's a lot of ideas similar to it um, around sharing, sharing different sharing infrastructures. So imagine like, you know, there's a block of 50 houses. They've all got gardens and they've all got 50 lawn mowers and 50 screwdrivers and 50 whatever. Um, and we know that our material consumption and our resource use has to change dramatically, right? And I think when, for in the, in the, in the West, we've struggled to even imagine that we might have to do things differently. But some of these ideas just make damn good sense, right? Like you don't want to store all that stuff in your house. You don't want to have that many things in your house. You don't want to have the responsibility for that much repair and cost. Um, and so, you know, imagine if every high street or precinct had a library of things where you could pop in and borrow a screwdriver for a couple of days. You could borrow the lawnmower once a month. And you could bring it back, right? And many people, uh, and you pay a small subscription fee and the repair is looked after, the looking after, the, the stewarding of all of that is looked after by someone and that we use uh, things that we use very rarely, like a massive tent or a set of hiking rucksacks or certain things that aren't so specific to us absolutely having to own it ourselves Mm -hmm. in our homes and store it in our homes. Um, And so that's an example. Library Things has uh, got a number of different locations now. Um, And and yeah, and there's a lot we could talk about. I won't talk about it maybe now. There's a lot we could talk about about how how are these business models viable? How do they work? uh, which you know we can maybe talk about later or another time because it's quite complex. Mm-hmm. But these modules of things like that, um, the men sheds movement was all about male mental health um, and finding the right types of spaces for men to open up and connect and do things perhaps in ways that were more suited to a whole demographic of men that felt isolated and unable to talk but also were great at making and doing and more likely to talk when they were in repairing. So, you know, imagine when you join up a repair cafe with a library of things and isolated uh, a demographic society that's struggling to talk about its mental health or imagine when you connect to an older population not quite um, completely unable to participate in society yet, have retired, have got lots to give and children and families who are struggling uh, with time with their children or with childcare or who are living away from their own elders or don't have access to a family, what happens when you start to convene these spaces? 
And so we know that a lot of the ideas of how to live better together exist um, in lots and lots of different ways. So many people have been pioneering this work. And so many of these ideas have been in tribes and communities um, and indigenous populations in the in the global south for centuries, right? Um, I grew up in an intergenerational household. It's not that bizarre to me about the mm. absolute radical difference it makes to live alongside your parents and your grandparents. Um, and, and what's required to make that work as well, right? Because it isn't all just utopia. It, there isn't just like some romanticized other future, um, but there are better, smarter ways, uh, more mm. creative, caring, loving ways for us to live. Um, and so, yeah, the Civic Square is really focused on building that um, e example, sharing it openly and connected to it for us then to demonstrate what happens when you have micro sites of land in your area. You've got a micro factory in your neighborhood. You could build community led housing like they're doing in Bristol and we can make um, on those sites with your neighborhood or you could retrofit your homes because you have access to the tools and to the knowledge. Um, so demonstrating that at a street level is another part of what we're really interested in and what the collective finance and governance and organizing that looks like. And certainly within that, what's the 21st century compass we need to hold, look at, have. And so we've been doing a lot of work with the Donut Economics Action Lab, um, looking at what it means to downscale the donut to the neighborhood scale. Now, co-creating and understanding the baseline of where we're at and then looking at how we can act um, and the leverage points. So we've been doing a lot of work on an actual direction that might be huge, but like is actually the correct direction, isn't, isn't one. And it's an honest direction that tells us that we are hugely overshooting on our planetary um, boundaries and we are massively under performing in terms of supporting the needs of our people and the 21st century challenge is to get into the safe and just space where we can balance them both whether that feels possible or not um where we are at um or whether we can imagine it in our lifetimes having the honest reality of the direction we need to go in um has been really important and again like we did at the hub it, in our local organizing and convening it's really been about platforming these ideas and building and co-creating understanding around them so yeah that's that's civic square and that's what we're trying to do we had quite a big delay during the pandemic in terms of construction and capital project but we are back live with that now and fundraising um, for that so if you're interested in doing something remarkable right like get in touch with me because it's really time to to shift to the next paradigm and i know there's people out there with with money that's burning a hole in their pocket and you, we can learn a lot from previous generations of people who had money burning a hole in their pocket uh, and we don't have to keep following the same story that we're stuck in and we don't have to keep being led by uh, a small group of men in Silicon Valley um, about how the rest of society is going to work albeit that scale of capital is really running running a lot right um, but through the pandemic in those delays we did lots of like creative turning our local green spaces into public living rooms lots and lots of pop-up ways to reimagine the spaces um so feel free to like look at a lot of our work online to have a peek at how we did a lot of that um so yeah that's Civic Square. amazing it's uh everything is such an achievement as i'm listening to you i'm thinking just about how everyone I interview is like, you know, these local acts of community resistance are so, so fundamentally important and a huge part of, of the ecosystem of resilience that has to happen because it's all very well and good having the theorists that are like bringing out the big ideas of how this could work on an international or a national scale. And we, we need to have those ideas, but to break through the, the barrier of, of power essentially, or the current paradigm, you need to implement those on the local level to show that they are not only work, but that they're effective and they're helpful and get your community behind in order to sort of spread the word. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just beautiful. Absolutely. And in a lot of those historical examples that I talked about, often they, those things did predate um, those demonstrators, those, the movement from, a, from the ground up often did predate mm. then that becoming public and societal good infrastructure that was adopted by governments and 
and like I think it's criti- critical you have to be able to build things that people can see and feel that are ambitious that are tangible that that start to step into a different paradigm um and and, and they later then go on to be adopted as as um you know visions for for national for a national peace and like i said i don't i don't praise the industrialists for a lot given that most of their wealth was extracted from the places that you know my ancestors and many of my peers were from but what i do rate them for is the moments that they realized they had to invest in wider public good that they had to show that cleaner air, higher quality housing, access to green spades for the workers, access to health. When they had to make those points, they actually did it. And Birmingham's littered with a history of gifted and covet- covenants on land uh, that is in service of those things. Um, it is littered with examples of investments into building that sort of think in different ways. Bourville Village Trust is an example of that from the Cadburys. Now, this is not trying to romanticize it, but um, at all, because of course it shouldn't be romanticized. And a lot of these, lot of these structures are currently really struggling with our, our uh, model of progress at the moment. But what I do, what you can see is a hundred years later, covenants that were in were done by privately wealthy individuals uh, private the private sector what would have been the private sector at that time that you would would be unbelievable to think of now right and um, mm. you, you, there's very little that happening with with uh, massive wealth in service of public good right we're just continually looking for new ideas to create more ROI to keep inflating this imaginary pot of of extreme wealth that is going to do what right it's going to do yeah. what with what the ipcc have, have told us about so i just i like i said i don't praise them from for, for loads but no i am interested in that because i think that often predates then a societal shift governments don't move to the most radical ideas immediately they move to what the people shift them to move towards um and you know that's got all sorts of challenges with what's happening right now but it is critical that we believe and draw from our own damn history, even if we don't want to have a respect for a, a wider understanding of a different way of living, which I certainly don't think that Britain and the UK, particularly in England, with what what's happening right now, is that interested in an, at a national scale. It might be in its pockets of organising and activists and amazing work that's happening, but at a governmental scale, it's certainly what not, they're not interested in. So for me, even in this very short period of time, whilst I'm not thinking about, whilst I'm not relating to the longer term picture here, we should be drawing from our own damn history, right? Which is that it is really critical that um, that we all engage in understanding the building blocks of a thriving society. Um, and we can't even think about thriving yet because we're not even close to human thriving and thriving can only happen when we have human and ecological thriving in, in balance. So, yeah, I I uh, feel very strongly about this, as you can tell. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I do think that a lot of the this comes... Robert Putnam is his name. He wrote a book all about um, how the public uh, movements actually really create those tipping points um, before governments adopt them. And that has been true in, in all of all of time. Hmm. I suppose the concern now, though, is the amount of A, disinformation that uh, flies around and then B, also the complete evident collusion now between um, media barons and their elite pals and governance. It does seem to be a particularly difficult time to have new stories penetrate the public consciousness because A, there's huge overwhelm and then B, there just isn't really a sort of left-wing outlet really anywhere in the global north that is capable of fulfilling its job of like peddling um, these alternatives to the mainstream because, well, everybody's afraid of getting sued in this country, quite frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, there's no doubt is there that we're, we're 
absolutely fundamentally trapped in um in the like you said the collusion between the mainstream media and uh, those with a very singular view about what and how we traverse the coming years right like um it's everywhere it's in education it's it's everywhere like you know skill the skills agenda has has moved to productivity and return on investment like capital is is in the most extractive ways ruling everything development is happening in in Birmingham city center we've um we've completely uh paved paradise right like we've paved through all the public squares has created an unbelievable amount of heat island effect um we have on the hottest day of 2022 the local park where I live, Summerfield Park, was seven degrees cooler than the main public square in the centre of Birmingham that had just been built, right? Like, we, we've we lost the plot. Mm. And, 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 you know, the everywhere I look, everywhere I go, all the work I see in the neighbourhood, people do understand this. They really understand this. There is incredible movements at all scales around land, ecology, around um, so, so, like, and around so much of what we know is going to be so important in the coming years. And I do agree that I think one of the things that is adding to not apathy, I don't think there's ap- apathy, I think people are burnt out. I think that's a particular strategy that's being employed to push things down. And yeah, people are politically homeless, right? It's terrifying what's what's just happened. We can't even differentiate between the main ruling party and the opposition at the moment. Yeah. Um Yeah. Yeah. It's devastating yeah. to see and all, all all I hope is I knew some of the people that have gone to join that administration and all I hope is that they know what they're doing. Right. All I know, all I hope is this 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 is some big game to get into power and to yeah. understand power in this country. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. entirely sure that this is at all yeah. how you should run that strategy, but look, yeah. I'm still gonna hold out. Yeah, hold yeah, hold yeah. out hope at the moment. But uh, you know, my political views are very much uh very different to what is currently happening right now. And I and I think with people like Jeremy Corbyn you can see exactly what happened in the mainstream media mm-hmm. colluded and what what and what and his own party just, yeah in uh, yeah exactly yeah. in his own party just the terrifying well the mainstream media and that party are also very much mm, pal- pals pals as well right like completely um, yeah, yeah 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 but like but the you know the leading civil servants just for context for any international leaders the leading civil senior civil servants in uh, the labor party undermined the elected leader yeah. Um, and the documents, there was a report and documents were leaked and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it has not been covered by a single mainstream paper in the yeah. six months now that it was published. Al Jazeera even did a full documentary on it, not yeah. one single article. Yeah, and, and um, you know, he's just been blocked again from yeah. um, being able to run as an MP. It's the most, it's just shocking. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, look, I'm not, I'm not here to like, I feel differently about hope, but I do. I do absolutely, fundamentally in my soul, deeply, deeply believe that um, that alongside all of the energy and hope and work that's happening in communities, in neighbourhoods, um, in cities all over this country, and there is so much, there is so, so much to draw on that we can't see each other, that's difficult. Like you said, the media is not rising the story up and we don't have effective ways of rising the story up. But I I don't think it's going to work, right? I don't think in any of history we've ever seen that this strategy works, right? Because once you get to a stage where those systems are crumbling, you start to see a resilience that cannot And you start to see an organizing and you start to see a healing and you start to see a coming together that cannot be organized 
by the conglomerates that cannot be organized by uh, and manipulated by the mainstream media. And so just one example of that is that small moment in time in the pandemic where we felt the worst of a, a global crisis and we were all in that first lockdown and we were all as uncertain as one another. Um, and it's that first lockdown I particularly refer to and what happened when we first came out of that first lockdown, the mild easing. The way in which our communities, our neighbourhoods came together, the way in which we at that time understood so critically, the key workers, the NHS. Now, I, I've got a lot to say on what carried on happening with that and a lot to say about what um, what uh, our government of the time um, uh, did. But you start to see this resilience and this organising and this care and this love and this craft and the stuff that only humans can do um, in a way that AI and other things would never be able mm. to repeat even in the medical industry um at medical the, the medical professions and many of them say themselves there's so much that technology is going to do to remove human error right and there's so many operations and types of interventions that can happen better with technology that's freaking great that isn't to displace people people will will need to and will always be unlocked in a way that only people can be, which is for care and craft and for love and complex cognition and for crisis and for reimagination and rebuilding. Like a society that was truly excited about what was coming with AI and technology would be, well, legislating it for safety, number one, <laughs> number one. Legislating it for safety first, for fuck's sake. Um, but secondly, uh, would be would be utilizing that to unlock the best in humans, to remove them from the jobs that treat them like robots. So um, there was this great tweet the other day from this lady who's like, I love, I love, um, I go into our local co-op, co it's somewhere in Scotland, I can't remember where she said. She goes, because everybody ignores the self-serve counters and queues up to talk to the, uh, to have a chin wag with the lady serving, right? Oh, did me. you do? That oh, you did that too. <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, well, oh. there we go. Right, okay. Well, listeners, that was not planned. Okay, that wasn't planned. Okay. <laughs> oh, excellent tweet. There you go. Right, thank well, you look, thank you. that was a great, and, and, and this is my, my fundamental example of um of what what we're what humans are searching for, right? So you know that broke woke tweet um uh kind of uh trend where it's like broke is this, woke is this, right? A broken us would go AI, let's AI is gonna take over everything. Let's make the outside world, like it's like you said, so miserable. So that uh, people can only just purchase their entertainment and we could just mm. like make a killing off it and there's the future of society. And AI is going to steal all our jobs and we should stop technology from progressing and we shouldn't let it happen because it could take all of our jobs, right? That's like broke us. Woke us would be that AI and technology, well regulated, and well deployed, not just in the service of Silicon Valley capital, uh, allows us to unlock humans in ways that we haven't been able to do over the last 200 years. Um, it makes some of our surgeries safer. It makes our capacity to do many things much, much better. It allows us to automate things that should have been automated but it allows us to unlock humans in ways that humans are best care and craft and complex yeah. cognition and crisis and imagination and love and yeah. building and, and uh, building uh, features and um, many of the things that we know make up important parts of community. 
Because when I, people go to, oh, sorry, go on. I was sorry, just going to go back. I just, yeah. oh, sorry, I have to jump because I think that word yeah. at the end is so important because yeah. broke is societal and woke is community in a sense. Yeah. And right yeah. now, like, the, as uh, you will know more than more than me, more than anybody listening, is that there is an erosion of our communities and there is a yeah. war, there's a war on community and there's a war on love. Yeah. So what we are looking at with the current paradigm and the current direction is that all of the, all of these things that you're discussing about, you know, the, our capacity for love, our capacity for complex cognition, our capacity for all of these things, they aren't being invested in because they're fundamentally unnecessary now to run society in a way, in a sense. Yeah. So the community at the top think. Because yeah. this is the thing around conservatism, right? Yeah. Like the right wing. They are very community focused. It's just yeah. that their community is absolutely tiny. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I'll come back to that in a second. Because mm. what I was saying was your tweet was very much like, when, when we're going into our local Tesco or co-op or whatever, we're not, it's not that we're there saying, don't let the technology take those people's jobs because what we want our peers to do is do low paid work, sat mm. on a chair for 10 hours a day so we can say hello to them for two minutes. That's not the reason why we're saying that. We're saying it because for some people, that'll be the only person they talk to all day. And um, for some people, that's the, at the, for, for most people, at the heart of a functioning society is popping into your shop and saying hi to the people that you're who work there and so on and so on, right? Um, and so it, there's a there's that layer that we've got to we've got to really crack in our minds that that even those in this stage, um, like because I don't think the future is is this, but like even our supermarkets that are moving to that space, like can understand really clearly if it wasn't just efficiency and um, profit at any cost, uh, the highest profit at any cost, um, would be understanding that what people are looking for is connection, mm. community, somebody to talk to, someone to give them a hand with certain things when they go into their local place. And arguably in this moment, don't come for me because my views are quite a lot more radical than this, but in this moment, arguably that's an investment point, right? Mm. That's an investment point if you want to differentiate yourself from the rest of what's going on particularly mm. in a cost of living crisis right is that people need help more than ever and those that start to move their models to that to be more supportive and connected and cohesive are going to be able to, to have a market share that is better right that's in this moment just to be really mm. clear and to what and, and so that's what i don't get right and what I don't get, and this is what happens when we've absolutely removed ourselves from, because what I, in my example of the industrialists, what they didn't have is this like miles and miles and miles of distance from where their industry was operating and where they existed. Mm, yeah. That, and that makes like, so, you know, you might have been like in Birmingham, for example, the Cadbury's might have lived in the hills and the workers were down in, in, in a city. But like, they had to go into those places. Like, it, you couldn't just have something on fire 10 miles away and you're just like lived, lived, living on the top of your hill being like, mm. I'm having a great time. So there's something about that, like, that unit of change and shift that will, I mm. think is, is critical. And mm. like in the pandemic, we saw people doing mutual aid efforts out of their kitchen and their gardens and serving food and doing all these things whilst literally being able to see on their high street all of the commercial kitchens shut up, all of the units shut up. And the only people with access to any of those units were not the big, the big um, uh, massive uh, companies, right? They were the smaller people whose owner lived around the corner and was able to unlock things safely for people to have access to. Whereas everybody else who was in a, in a very different model, was just closed up and locked up um, until, and then just closed out, right? Like, um, until absolute down um, opened, which is really un, and very unresilient way to run, run things anyway. So what you just said before though, I do ag agree with this. And look, I don't have the answers. If anybody listening has got the answers, but one thing I do 
really, like I said, strongly believe is if you believe in what the IPCC have shared, then we've got some catastrophes coming up. Yeah. And they aren't going to be able to be controlled by a small number of people at the top of anywhere. Mm-hmm. No, no, like, yes, look, absolutely. The Conservative government during the pandemic showed that what your government is like is how everything will go. We had a corrupt, extractive, uh, unimaginative, uh, disaster capitalist, like trying mm-hmm. to think of words uh, that that can speak to this time. Very unintelligent government. In, for, for a government of business, God, these are really don't know how to invest smartly in, in things that will have multiple benefits. Yeah. Right. So yes, absolutely, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying even in the worst of catastrophes in the global south, climate catastrophes makes a massive, massive difference who is in charge. And there's no way that we should let go of that. There's no way she would, we should let go of the accountability, the fight, the vision, this horrible, unimaginative, awful place that we're currently in with the opposition. Um, we should fight. We should absolutely fight and we should be smart and we should be holding that to deep account and participating in it. And we know that unfortunately crisis is coming and we know that in those moments, more and more times like the pandemic will be true. And in times like that, the people actually do have incredible amounts of power, right? And so what we do in these relatively stable periods, and when I say relatively, it is all relative because as you say, people are exhausted. Their finances have been depleted. The cost of living has completely, like, it's it's the hardest and most austere time for everyone. And perhaps that isn't the time where we feel like the imagination and what is possible is at the at the the most uh, isn't thriving the most in us. But I that's the bit where I draw from probably quite a different experience, right? Which is that I my parents and grandparents came from India. And my grandparents came from India post-partition and they left everything behind, everything they knew. And they'd watched a lot of it be destroyed. They come to a country of where they are back being the shit on people's shoes, right? To rebuild, rebuild the country. But never in the 80 years of which I got to live with my grandmother, uh, the, uh, sorry, the 35 years I got to live, the 80 years that my grandmother got to live, and I've spoken to a lot of people about her, her, um, how she was. But in the 35 years nearly that I knew her, she always believed from nothing to the last days that she she passed away. She always believed that something far greater for her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren was possible. Now, coming from the space of having lost everything and to be on the bottom of a ship with four sick kids it, coming across the country to a country that doesn't want you when you get here, uh, thinks you're worth pretty much worthless having extracted all your, your worth and wealth. Um, and then you end up doing the, the worst jobs and you end up spending your entire life doing those jobs to still have imagination about the future. Mm. Imagination. And whenever you spoke to her, you should, there wouldn't be a single... Now, I'm not advocating for uh, South Asian women to not have any joy or pleasure, right? But she would never, ever even mention that she thought... that She, she, she was never as pessimistic as we, we, were, we are in this conversation, right? And that's mm. like... Her, for her, her f- imagination, maybe she wouldn't call it that, but her belief in this world that looked nothing like the one she had be- seen, lost, been part of, rebuilt, was always there. It was always front and centre. And so that's where this piece that I have, I draw that inspiration from somewhere else because these two stories don't make sense. They don't stack up currently in our narratives because it is true people are struggling the most they have it is 
that there is a tactic to burn us all out. There is a tactic to destroy the imagination and the possibility. There is, um, there is a, a tactic to make us not see each other and not be able to know that anything else is possible. The mainstream media is is creating so many challenges. There's that, and that sounds like this world where it's like, well, what could be possible in this? Then it's impossible. And then there's what I've lived and grown up, which is the people that I descend from have seen nothing but horror and terror for the last 150 years, whether it be the Sikhs in Punjab or whether it be um, India as a whole post-partition or whether it be the, the times that they came into this country. And whilst a lot of the descendants for me of, of my grandparents and so on we all have a lot of work to do to think about what that progress actually looks like. This is not something to say that, you know, we figured out a second generation what progress actually looks like because a lot of people have just followed a very, like, wing capitalist, like, direction. But my point is, is that imagination can exist where it feels like hope is completely lost and it might look different. It might not look like loads of workshops of post-its and dreams and 100 years from now but it is a massive act and leap of imagination to believe in anything in this time to have children in this time to build community in this time to keep trying in this time and that's why I always say yes to things like this because we do have to keep finding each other and my my less hopeful note is that perhaps it will be crisis worse than we care to imagine right that will actually activate us in ways and that will actually break us free of of this monopoly that we're we're part of currently um but not to lose hope that those structures because in every time the people are more powerful than those structures and we're just at a particular moment right now where everything feels really really difficult but i i do deeply believe that um that what we and many of the people you have on your podcast and many of the peers that i work with what we're building is the 40 years before the nhs where it was small groups of people pe peddling ideas that at that time the gentry would be like you must be joking free healthcare for everybody at point of need, not because you can pay. Um, or there's a there's a great moment where the Libraries Act went into um, the uh, a Parliament, and one of the there's a quote. Let me see if I can see it. And um, there's a quote that one of the parliamentarians said that I thought was really interesting when um, when the Libraries Act was being put into place, and he he said. Um, when, so when this guy called William E. Watt introduced his public libraries bill in 1849, he encountered considerable hostel hostility in the House of Commons. It was argued that the rate paying middle and upper classes would be paying for service that would mainly be used by the working classes. One argued that the people have too much knowledge already. It was much easier to manage than 20 years ago. The more education people get, um, the more they get difficult to manage. And so like, you know, that was, that was back in what, 1849, right? So, you know, these, the ideas that, that, um, the, these ideas have been around with us for a long time and we have still fought through and broke through. And unfortunately in British history, most of the time when they do break through to a national scale, it's because, because actually industry as is can no longer function with this level of so societal decay right and i would just say that no matter how much it feels to us that there are a handful of people in the media in tech and in government that are in charge of everything we've really seen if anything we've really seen from the government um a lot of the work by led by donkeys coming out mm. you know they don't know what they're doing they really don't what they're trying to do is actually absolutely fundamentally milk this moment for all it is and all it has. Um, and we are more powerful than that. And we have to believe that. 
Um, and we have to keep coming together and we have to keep demonstrating alternative futures, telling those stories whilst fight like, and being much more propositional to that whilst being opposition to these forces and being able to start to look for and find ways in which to uh, mobilize our power most effectively. And I say that as a person who does feel quite deflated at the moment by the scale of all of these these different factors that we've talked about a bit in this podcast, but it is critical that we don't lose. We don't lose hope, we don't lose belief, and we don't stop organising and um, and we don't stop finding and connecting with one another because I do think a new story is on its way. It's just for us, we're just miles out of it yet. And so it feels like we're stuck in the middle of like, well, it's really obvious these old systems are broken and shit, it looks like it's ages before we can mm -hmm. do any of those. And that's a particular, particularly difficult spot. And that's where I think we have to find most hope and resilience and draw on each other and the histories that we have and the ancestry that we do have and share those stories generously uh, in organising with one another. The night is always darkest before the dawn, right? Yep. And Lord, it's dark right now, isn't it? <laughs> and long. This night seems to be going on for a very long time. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. It's like, God, you know, it's been going on for a, for a, a long, long while. But, you know, like... I, I think it's a, that's a, I know it's a joke to joke about it, but also like, you know, this is, this is the time for those of us who particularly have, uh, who, who descend from the global south to know that a lot of the things that, you know, we're all banging on about carbon and net zero here, but a lot of the impacts of extreme weather, food insecurity, flooding, droughts, like so much of this has been experienced for so many people for so long yeah. and created by so many of us and our past actions uh, in this country, so much mine, but like literally, you know, that, that, that structure that we are now all complicit in as well and are all participating in, you know, we, and, and so many of those communities have had to imagine and reimagine themselves over and over again as a result of us. And whilst it feels dark and hard and long, we absolutely sitting in this country today have to reflect on our relative privilege mm -hmm. and we have to give this everything. And that's where it is important to look after our well-being, look after one another, but it's really important to not navel gaze. Mm -hmm. And not to completely like, I don't know, I don't know what to like, Western spiritualize our own like flipping space within this. Yeah, it's hard. Yes, we have to take accountability that as a country, we can't even figure out how to look after our own people and get them the basics of food. And we can't even organize like to, to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So having... Having colonized half the world, right? Having extracted and created so many of these challenges globally, ecologically, from a climate perspective, from a resource perspective, we still got back here and still weren't able to meet the needs of our people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I do think it's really critical that relatively privileged people in this country right now, that yeah, we're having a hard time. Yeah, it's dark. Um, yeah, it's difficult, but we understand that contextually. We still are in the like top one or 0.1% people in the world with agency, ability, resource, voices, um, relative stability to act. We have to be really careful about that balance of like how, yes, collective care, well-being, all of this is super, super important. But I'm concerned that we've over-individualized it and we overuse mm -hmm. it to get ourselves off the hook. Because if we really did care about those principles, I'm pretty sure some of our neighbors wouldn't be starving and going to the food bank, right? And so yeah. we've just got to be really careful and honest with ourselves in this organizing. And I have to do that with myself, right? Because I am like also exhausted at times and broken and just like, I can't do this. Um, 
And then I like draw from examples of my grandmother and other other people. At a, that's just an individual perspective. At a collective scale, we just have to be really careful that we don't we don't we aren't a society that created so many of these problems and then over intellectualized ourselves and individualized our own care out of the agency and power and responsibility we do have to act as well. And I think that's I'm sitting within that tension. I don't have answers, but I do think that this is something really important for um uh, all of us here, um in in particularly the global north and on in this perspective in the the UK to like find that balance of care and support and well being for one another um and recognise our relative privilege and complicit com complicit complicity oughtness, whichever mm -hmm. the word is, in, in a lot of this um still because we are still participating in in many of the systems and ideas mm. that are accelerating all this and yeah look it's frustrating and we feel all feel we feel gutted and demotivated and unable to understand how to mobilize post what happened in the elections in 2017 and what's happening in our political space now but we have to break through that right yeah it can't be like a zero-sum kind of oh shit the mainstream media the opposition like we have a responsibility to that and we have to speak and those who are speaking and those who are organizing if you can't speak and organize you can have their backs you can support them mm -hmm. and if you can't do any of that mutual aid mutual aid is at the heart of how we start to rebuild our communities right we all have neighbors who are struggling to pay their bills are struggling to eat um mutual aid of just making a table a bit longer with nobility uh finding ways to get out of this horrendous like cycle where we've just put all of that to feed banks and to services and you can rebuild those acts where you are even if you feel completely de um uh, like f completely like your agency is is being um s squashed by uh what's happening around you mm -hmm. don't don't let all that just stop that those acts of, of care and love and agency and organizing that can happen at a micro scale because you don't know, like, like in COVID, you don't know at the turn of a hat where that might start to become life saving uh, yeah. infrastructure. Um, and, and I think we all have responsibility to, to that. And I guess ultimately that's what keeps me going as well. It's that balance of like, you ca I can't get inside my head too much because. I'm not my grandmother. I am now two generations who've benefited from this country. And I have a lot of knowledge about what we've done, what we're doing. We're still complicit in what's ahead. And I have to use that in the best possible way. Even if this wasn't my ancestors' wireless dreams for what I would be doing right now. Mm. Mm. And I think everybody has to really take up that challenge and mantle and, and find whatever it takes to not be depleted by that. Um, and like I said, mutual aid is still at the heart of of so much better quality housing, support, food, community, uh, the green space. These are at the heart of what will start to rebuild like our, our neighborhoods, even if AI is telling you that it's all the solutions lie within it. Some do. It's, it's not a, we don't have to do this like analog tech fight or battle. It's not that. It's just that we're we're talking about very different domains as what to, uh, what underpins the society and as much as you know that vision of like we're all just everything will be so miserable so we'll just be sat in our houses as much as, as that is true we also know it isn't right i loved i loved a good like as a fairly privileged able-bodied person in the pandemic yeah i love binge watching the occasional netflix i had a lot of people pass away i had a lot of grief it was great to be able to sit down and just do you not think of what? But come on, the majority of uh, people with any privilege were out in green space all day, every day. Like, you have to look at the patterns of humans as well. They aren't, this isn't like we're not robots. This is not the thing we default to. The amount of people that were reflecting on hearing the birds and going out for walks, right? And they might have been um, a a privileged part of society um, compared to the key workers, but we didn't 
we didn't just run to being like, oh, great, I can just sit at home all day and just play computer games and watch TV. We, we moved to something else. Mm. And most people in this country, one of the biggest surprising things I ever found when I started to meet people with older money was that, they just love walk, going for walks with the dogs at the weekend. <laughs> and all they do is just like want to go and like make slow gin or go for a walk or do like w- wealth has not always been it associated with just hyper consumption, right? So we've got to hold, hold out. Yes, it has like, there's lots in terms of like, like we said, the wealthiest people are the highest, um, uh, uh, and, emission that had the highest emissions and consumption but like there's other stories um and often like wealth is just trying to buy itself time and space and <laughs> being able to go to for walks and not have to participate in the work <laughs> and all of this so i'm just like not convinced in this whole story anyway um mm. uh, even even when you look back to some of the wealthiest people from where my grandparents came from like they were buying themselves time and life and space and and ultimately I just don't think the human psyche pre just keeps moving towards this vision that mm. that um, that Silicon Valley has for us. I be- I believe in something very different. But what we do do with the best of tech is we do smart things, and I like that. Like the best of tech allows us to do smart things. We just have to overshoot first because we think it's going to be some some like answer to all our problems mm-hmm. um so yeah uh i don't know i really still believe deep in a better world in a better us yeah in a better world in a better us i love that what a great note to end on Imi. thank you so much my final question for you is who would you like to platform hmm. i would like to platform if you haven't spoken to them already um uh, melissa mean from we can make in Bristol, um, uh, part of the North West Media Centre, absolute legends, um, in a council built estate called North West in Bristol, uh, a media centre opened 20 years ago. Recently, Melissa engaged that population more deeply in how to connect technology, imagination, and the social challenges of the place, of which one was the housing crisis um the estate alone had quite a long waiting list um for overcrowding for many different things and she built a micro factory in the neighborhood that could use te- modern methods of construction to build to have communities be participating in building and designing their own housing wow. and then they found hundreds of spots of micro sites of land disused massive gardens that were too big for one family to look after um different sites across the neighborhood and discovered that you could build uh, amazing low carbon um homes and start to change the dynamic of some of the housing issues there for example unhoused people being um no longer homeless um and being able to sh- to find peer support with someone who had a massive garden and who was also isolated and then they used a microsite to build a beautiful home or a home where a family had grown up and then the daughter had gone on to have children and now they were overcrowded and moving away or being put on a list somewhere else would ruin all the intergenerational connections mm. the child care support the familial support so the daughter and ha- her daughter or son were able to move build and design a home really close to their parents Amazing. and move out and so um the work melissa has done on both the economics of of that of the common senseness of why are we why are we running things like this the fact that she stayed in north west which is an amazing place but to those on the outside or in power they would be like what in what innovation can happen here Mm. she's done it with the people of the place she's built the infrastructure like the micro factory in Norwest, and they've got this amazing film and i recommend you just go watch it it's only seven or eight minutes long and it's just so inspiring 
And yeah, go look it look it up because that is something that could start to be implemented today and now. Um, and she's got all of the policy implement uh, in, uh, policy ideas um, and shifts that could happen to support it. So yeah, we can make in Bristol a melisamine. That's who I'd like to wonderful. Work with. Oh, Amy, this has just been awesome. Thank you so much for your time and your work. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. Um, and thanks for that great tweet. What a great moment that was in our little conversation. <laughs> I was like, this great person did this tweet. And I was like, it's a great example of how tech isn't isn't quite the app. We're just directed in the wrong way. And then you were like, uh, that was me, mate. If you want to learn more about Civic Square, about Impact Hub, about Immy's work and about We Can Make in Bristol, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.